I want to reassure you guys, I've set an alarm. I will get you out of here before kickoff. So that only gives me six hours to, first of all, thank you, Pastor Herman, for inviting me to participate in the impossible task of describing who God is. Mike, I feel like I'm really loud. Am I really loud? I'm good? Okay. I feel like I'm really loud. So, in trying to describe who God is, um, the, the name of God that I chose for this week is one that I've been, I don't want to use the term fixated on, but it's probably the one that I've spent the most time studying. And in fact, as I was looking through my records, I, um, I actually preached a message on the names of God highlighting this particular name in 2012. Um, the name that, that I'm going to be talking about this week is Jehovah Sidkenu, the Lord our righteousness. Now, there's a lot that goes into that. So, if you would, if you could open up your Bibles with me to Jeremiah chapter 33, verse number 15. And I'm just going to read a couple of scriptures and we're going to get into the Word. Amen? So again, that's Jeremiah 33, verse number 15. And when you have it, if you would please stand. So this is what it says. It says, In those days and at that time, I will cause to grow up to David a branch of righteousness. He shall execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will dwell safely. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord our Righteousness. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Father God, for everything that you've done this morning. We thank you, Father God, for being here in the service. And I pray now, Lord Jesus, that you would speak through me this morning. Let me be the first hearer of your word. And I pray, Father God, that you would open up everybody's hearts to receive the word that you have for them this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And amen. You may be seated. So, Jehovah Sidkenu. The Lord, our righteousness. That, that's been a concept that I've had a hard time dealing with. Okay, because it says the Lord, our righteousness. Or the Lord is my righteousness. Now, that, that really got me to thinking, first of all, what does righteous mean? And when I read this definition, I want you to think about this for just one second and then ask yourself if it is possible for man to be righteous. Acting in accord with divine or moral law, free from guilt or sin. So by show of hands, who here would consider themselves righteous? The definition is acting in accordance with divine or moral law, free from guilt or sin. See, now this is, this is where the rabbit hole now takes me. Okay, there's, 
there's really three parts to that definition that I really want to hone in on. But before I get into that, I have to talk about a couple of different perspectives of what it means to be righteous. See, we can consider ourselves righteous. That's called self-righteousness. Now, before I go any further, let me just say, not all self-righteousness is bad. Most of it is. But not all self-righteousness is bad. We can do things that would be considered righteous. And the third aspect of it is we can live a life seeking righteousness. Okay, now of those three things, I think, I think it's important to note that we all have the ability to commit righteous acts. Okay, and we all have the ability to live a righteous life. But we have to be very, very careful which version of righteousness that we choose to accept. See, because most people, I hate using the term most people, because it makes me feel like I'm yelling at someone. I'm not yelling at you guys this morning. If you're offended, it's your fault, not mine. So, <laughs> the way most of us see righteousness is when we compare ourselves to others. Well, I may be a gossiper, but I'm more righteous than that person because they lie. You know what? I may be a liar, but I'm more righteous than that person because they're a thief. You know, I may not be perfect, and I may be a thief, but I'm more righteous than that person because they're an adulterer. Well, I may be an adulterer, but I'm more righteous than that person because they're a blasphemer. And that's real bad. You know, I may blaspheme the Holy Spirit every once in a while, but I'm more righteous than that person because they're a murderer. But see, what does Scripture tell us? Scripture tells us that if you have violated one of these commandments, then you have done what? Violated them all. Yet we, as people, with this nasty stuff called flesh, like to put grades on sin. See, we've got what we call the minor sins. Those are the ones that everybody, well, everybody gossips. It's no big deal. Oh, he's a murderer. That's real bad. And I'm not going to get into politics, but there are some other sins right now that it seems like the church is looking at worse than murder. Not going to go there. <laughs> Not going to go there. <laughs> but God never put a severity level on sin. See, in the legal system, we all have all kinds of levels, right? We got manslaughter, we got second degree murder, we got first degree. We've got all these levels. And those levels have come into the church where we look at one sin as being lower than another sin and we judge ourselves based off of the severity of our sins. And if we only have the little minor sins, then we are, by default, more righteous and holy than those that have the greater sin. Y'all can correct me if I'm wrong, and that's how a lot of people think. <laughs> but at the end of the day, going back to Scripture, it's very, very clear. If you violate one, you violate them all. So that little sin of gossiping or that little sin of lying, God does not look at that any differently than somebody who is committing murder. It's a violation of his law. So, when we compare ourselves to others and we grade the sins, I, if, I tried to find a better word than grade, but you all, you all get the point of what I'm saying. It's, 
when, when we look at others' lives and we judge our own righteousness based off of others' lives, it's self-righteousness. We are not any better than anybody. If anyone in this room has never, ever sinned, you're doing better than everybody but Jesus. <laughs> Let's be real. We strive to live a sin-free life. We strive to live a righteous life. But the only person that has ever actually achieved that lifestyle is Jesus Christ. Now, that's not to say that you can't act righteously. And I'm going to give you an example of somebody who acted righteously. When God told Abraham that he was going to make him a mighty nation, he said, but I don't have any kids. Okay? All God did was he looked at him and he said, I will cause you to have a son. Look up at the stars and number them. And if you could number them, that's how many descendants you will have in this generation. And what did Abraham do? He believed God. And then Scripture records, just because he believed God, that it was counted to him as righteousness. Now, this is where I got stuck. It doesn't say Abraham was righteous. See, I had to read through those Scriptures a whole bunch of times to get to that point. It was counted to him as righteousness, but it never said that he was righteous. See, because if we go back to that definition of righteous, acting in accord with divine or moral law, free from guilt or sin. See, that first part of that definition is where Abraham found himself. Acting in accordance with divine or moral law. He believed God. Okay, so what I would say is the, the path to righteousness starts with one thing. Believing God. So if we don't believe what God says, we are already not on that path. And you will never be able to get to where you need to be if you're on the wrong road. There's a saying, though, no matter how far you've traveled, if you're on the wrong road, turn around. See, we all have that ability to turn around. For example, when, when I felt like God was first calling me to preach, whew, I saw the road, and I was like, you know, God, I see that road, but I like that road better. So I started walking down every other road that I could possibly walk down, because I didn't see that. I didn't see myself ever standing up in front of a congregation delivering a word. I used to say all the time that I don't like public speaking. That's not a lie. That's fact. I don't. Um, so for me, it's, it was something that was way out of my comfort zone, and it was putting me into a position that I never thought I would be in. Therefore, though I knew the road to travel, I went the other way. How many of us have done that? How many of us are still doing that? <sighs> when you know you're going the wrong way, turn around. See, because what that means, when it says acting in accordance with divine or moral law, that means agreeing with God and doing something about it. See, it's not just enough to hear his voice. We have to listen to his voice, and we have to do what his voice tells us to. Somebody could say, well, God said I'm supposed to be a missionary in Africa. 
Well, how many times have you been? Oh, I ain't been yet. <laughs> well, when are you going? I don't know. Cool, you have a calling. Fulfill it. Go and do the thing that God has called you to do. The second part of that is free from guilt or sin, and I'm going to break that up because I love this part. See, it's easy for me to be free from sin for a couple minutes or a couple hours. Sometimes I might even get a day if I don't have to drive anywhere because if I'm driving... <clears throat> we're not going to talk about that. <laughs> but then there's the harder part. And I say harder part, and it's harder part for me. I'm not saying that this is a blanket statement, but it's harder part for everybody. But for me, this is harder. Free from guilt. See, we've all got those things in our past. Then when we think about those things, it makes us feel a certain way. And we look back on those things and we regret them. We regret them to the point where even thinking about them can turn down our mood. See, God has already forgiven us of the things that we have asked Him to forgive us of. But what's harder for most people to do than anything is to forgive ourselves. And when I say forgive ourselves, I mean truly forgive ourselves for the things that we have done in our past. There are people that are walking around today that are trying to live a lifestyle that shows that God is in control of their lives, but they are carrying such a heavy burden of something that has happened in the past that they can't move into their future because of the weight that they're carrying. When God forgives us, it's final. We don't have to keep asking God to forgive us of this thing over and over. See, because when we ask Him, He does There's no stipulations. There's no contract. There's no time period. There's no expiration date on God's forgiveness. But we hold on to things for a long time. In fact, some of us will forgive ourselves for something and everything will be going great for a year or two years or three years and then something will happen that will remind us of that situation from the past where we pick up our forgiveness of ourselves, put it back in our pocket, and put that thing back on as if it just happened. See, that's one of the things that the enemy tries to do. When you have truly forgiven yourself of something, you have to remind yourself that you are forgiven. Because if you don't remind yourself that you are forgiven, the enemy will come in to remind you that it's still there. And he will constantly remind you that it's still there until it causes you to believe that God hasn't forgiven you either. And when we start to fall into that, that's a wedge. And every chance he gets, he tries to drive that wedge in to our situation, into our relationship with God. And that wedge is something that we have to be ever mindful of because the more we let it fester, the more we think on those things, the more we entertain those thoughts, the deeper that wedge gets. And then all of a sudden, we're no longer reading our word. We're no longer hearing from God. And what do we do? We blame ourselves. Why are we blaming ourselves? Because of that thing that happened years ago. See, that's why I love this part. The Lord, our righteousness. Not my righteousness. Our righteousness. See, because my righteousness, my self-righteousness 
has ups and downs. It has levels. When things are going good, hey, it looks great. I'm, I guess I'm being righteous. When things are going bad, well, I guess I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do. I guess everything's going wrong. But thank God we have a God who is our righteousness that doesn't sway from day to day, that doesn't change in the morning and in the evening, that is our righteousness all the time, always and forever, never diminishing. See, that is the Jehovah Sidkenu, the Lord, our righteousness. That is who He is. He is the unwavering righteousness that can only be in us through His Son, Jesus Christ, who is the only one that has ever actually lived up to that measure. When we accept that, then I can stand up here proudly and say, I am righteous. Because he who is righteousness lives on the inside of me. Not because of anything I have done, but because of who he is, I can say it. We have an unwavering, unrelenting God who loves us so much that no matter what we've done, He's forgiven us. He loves us. He sent His one and only Son to die on the cross so that we may be healed and have everlasting life. That is the righteousness that lives on the inside of every single believer. See, remember, we got to go back to that first righteous act. All Abraham had to do was believe God. And it was counted to him as righteousness. In the New Testament, all we have to do is believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He died for us, and that He rose again and sits at the right hand of the Father, and we have eternal life. We have salvation. We have that righteousness living on the inside of us. It's not about anything you've done. In fact, I got, a, I got another rabbit hole. Proverbs 21.3 messed me up. Proverbs 21.3 says this, to do righteousness and justice is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. You mean I can't earn it? I can't give enough to be considered righteous? I know people that had fallen away from the church, but for years were still sending in their tithes and offerings. And I can honestly say this because of what the Scripture says. God don't care about that. He doesn't. If you're sacrificing everything you can sacrifice and you're giving everything you can give and you're doing everything you can do, that's great. That's not what God wants. What does God want? Us. He wants a relationship with us. So a lot of people, myself included, try to do things that we think will be counted as righteousness. It's not what he's looking for. What he wants is us. And if we go back to that definition again, I'm going to keep going back to that definition because there's, I could probably preach a whole message on every word of the definition. <laughs> Acting in accordance with divine or moral law. Working together with God. That's what acting in accordance means, right? You know, at the, at the shipyard, I have to read through and sometimes write a lot of procedures. And I know Pastor Shanika and Sister Monica, I know you guys fall into this too. There's an acronym that we use. It's IAW. Okay, just about everything we do and say at the shipyard is IAW. IAW stands for in accordance with. 
So we say that we are going to do something IAW applicable procedures. So if we as Christians can develop that same mindset that we are going to say and do the things that we need to do in accordance with <laughs> applicable procedures, God was very nice and he only gave us one procedure. It may be a couple thousand pages long, but if we are acting and doing and living our lives in accordance with his procedure, we already meet the first part of the definition of righteousness. Free from guilt or sin, that's taking a little bit more work. But whose freedom are we talking about? My freedom or the freedom he gives us? See, because if I stand up here, I will not ever say that I am free from guilt or sin. Any pastor that says he's free from guilt and sin, <laughs> Pastor Hermes said it. He is lying. But see, my definition of freedom and his definition of freedom are completely different things. See, because his definition includes forgiveness. So if he's forgiven your sins, then you are free from that sin. You are free from that guilt. So with that same God living on the inside of us, we can experience righteousness. And we do not have to do all kinds of things to earn it. It's something that he freely gives to us. So, it comes from God. When Paul was introducing himself to the church in Philippian, or Philippi, he tells the church that he's filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. I don't know about y'all, but Paul is somebody that I think he could consider himself righteous. But again, that's me judging his righteousness based off of my lack of everything else. Okay, but his righteousness, he says, comes through Jesus Christ. Any righteousness that you possess or proclaim apart from the righteousness that God puts into you is self-righteousness. And here's where I got stuck again. I got to tell you, I got stuck on this one a lot this week. Because see, this is how we do it. I want to read you a scripture. And I want you to tell me what you hear in this scripture. Luke 5, 27, 28. It says, after this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. Now see, Levi was a tax collector. That was out of Luke. Luke identified Levi as a tax collector. Y'all catch that, right? See, Luke said they went up to the tax collector named Levi. Levi, whose name changed to Matthew, was not identified by who he is, he was identified by what he is. We as the church, Luke included, need to stop looking at people for what they are and start looking at people for who they are. This caught me, because this is Luke. See, in Matthew... Matthew didn't call himself a tax collector. Matthew said Jesus went up to the tax collector's booth and met a man named Levi. See, Matthew's words and Luke's words are completely different here. See, Matthew did not look at himself as just the tax collector. But see, in those times, tax collectors were bad people. And that's how Luke identified him. Luke said, hey, there's the tax collector, Levi. 
See, and sometimes we do the same thing with ourselves. We don't identify ourselves based on who we are. We identify ourselves based on what we are. Pastor Herman says it all the time. There's a homeless person under a bridge that can sing better than he can. Just about everybody can sing better than I can. So I, I can't use that same analogy. But... Why is it got to be a homeless man? It is a man who just happens to be homeless. When we start to change the frame of how we look at people and start looking at people for who they are as opposed to what they are, then we can start to introduce the Jehovah Sid canoe to them as well. Amen. See, because Jesus isn't the Jehovah Sid canoe just for me. It's for everybody. Everybody that does what? Believes. And when we treat people based off of their circumstances and their situations, how likely are we to be able to introduce them to our God? I've had this argument with people a lot. If you go to my Facebook wall, you will not see political posts. You will not see me posting about my opinion on current topics. And I'm not saying that anybody in this room does that. But what if I started? What if I started talking about the vaccine and mandates and started talking about politics and the president and started talking about any other topic that is really big on social media right now. Whether I'm for it or against it doesn't matter. When I state my opinion, I have just eliminated the ability to minister to anybody that disagrees with me. No matter what I say, when I say it, the way it is going to be perceived by the people that disagree is going to make it impossible for me to minister to those people. See, that goes back to the we are ambassadors for Christ. If we are ambassadors for Christ, guess what? We are also ambassadors for His righteousness. So we have to be very careful when we speak that we are not speaking in such a way that eliminates the ability of somebody to receive that righteousness just because of some stupid political stance we have decided to die on. What kind of gifts would we have missed out on if Jesus saw Matthew as a tax collector. See, because Matthew wasn't just one of the 12. He was one of the inner four. He was one of the ones that was closer to Jesus than the rest of the 12. But he's a tax collector. It means he's a liar and a thief. At no point did Jesus ever call Matthew a tax collector. The disciples did. The Pharisees did. The religious people at the time actually scorned Jesus for having dinner with tax collectors. These are the people that are supposed to be the ones introducing those people to God. So what the scripture really says in those verses, the church rejected them because of their profession. It's kind of a harsh way to put it, don't you think? Yeah, but tell me it's not true. They were rejected because of what they did for a living. 
Are there any professions now that the church rejects? I would say yes. But we're not rejecting professions. We're rejecting people. We're rejecting people based off of their circumstances. Church, we got to do better. We got to stop looking at the person for what they do and start looking at the person for who they are. Inside of that person, there could be so many gifts that are untapped, and just that person is just waiting to get that spark of belief that will unlock all of their potential. Right now, there is a stripper somewhere that is supposed to own a Fortune 500 company, but because everybody only looks at that person as a stripper, that person's potential was never fulfilled. And all it would have taken was one person to look beyond the profession and look at the person and realize the gifts that that person had on the inside of them and not just the outward appearance. See, when we start looking and having a focus on people, then we are meeting the first part of that definition where we are now acting in accordance with divine or moral law. See, Jesus didn't look at people for what they were, who they were, or their circumstances. He looked at them because he loved them. Regardless of whatever their situation or circumstance was, Jesus Christ looked at them with love only in his eyes. Righteousness also has a lot more benefits. In 1 Peter 3.12 it says, For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. When we believe what God says in his word, when we believe that he died on the cross and rose again so that we may be saved, when we believe and we act in accordance with his divine and moral law and we repent of our sins and we get rid of the guilt and the shame that follows some of us for years and years, when we get rid of those things, then the Jehovah Sidkenu, the Lord our righteousness, will not only see us for who we are, but he will also hear our prayers. See, a lot of times we question whether or not God hears us. There may be something that we've been praying over and over and over again. Well, God, I've been praying about this for two months and I haven't seen anything happen yet. God, can you not hear me? Yeah, he can. If you are a born-again believer, he can hear you. It just may not be time yet. There may be some other things that God is working out. But keep pressing. Keep praying. Keep pushing through. Revelations, it says, To him who overcomes and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. He will dash them to pieces like pottery. It's perseverance. It's pushing through. Even when you don't see anything happening, it's continuing to move forward. See, righteousness is a lifestyle. It's not something that happens overnight. It's something that, excuse me, you spend your entire life doing. Righteousness is a path. And it is not the quick road in often cases. Excuse me. Sometimes righteousness requires perseverance. Sometimes righteousness requires patience. Sometimes righteousness requires long-suffering. Sometimes righteousness requires sacrificing. But it is given to us freely. It is a tool that we have in our toolbox that is the Holy Spirit living on the inside of us. And as long as we are doing things in accordance with the procedures that he gives us, we have access to it. So here's my charge. Believe him. When he speaks to you, believe that what he's saying is for you. More importantly, move 
in accordance with what he's telling you. Start doing something. Start taking the steps that you need to take to see his words become the truth in your life. Ask him to forgive you. There's no easy way to say this next part. Get rid of your guilt. If God's not holding it against you, why are you? Are you better than him? Oh, wait, that's also self-righteousness. Get rid of the guilt. And then finally, share. Share that righteousness. Share God with everybody that you can. Even if they don't dress that way even if they happen to be homeless. Look beyond the outward appearance. Look beyond the profession. Look beyond the circumstances. Look beyond the troubles that they may be in and look at the person. Because see, if I went back to 1997, I would not think in a million years that God could love me based off of the lifestyle that I was living at the time. God wouldn't want me. If God would have told me back then that someday I was going to preach a message, I'd have probably laughed. That would have been such a far-fetched idea for me. And I want you all to keep something in mind. Back at that time, I was also going to church. I was in church but God wasn't in me. So outward appearances sometimes, most times, are completely deceiving. People put on masks. You know, they say sometimes that one of the fakest days of the week is Sunday. Because you walk around, hey, how you doing? Oh, I'm blessed and highly favored. But on the inside, that person is so torn down that They could barely get up out of bed that morning. It was everything they could do just to drag themselves to church, just to tell people that they're fine. we got to look past all of that and love people for who they are. And that's the Lord our righteousness. God wants relationship with us. There's only one way to start that process. So, I know everybody in here. You know, we're, we're, a, we're a family. But I can't see the list of everybody that's online. So, I want to give an opportunity for people that don't know God to accept Him so that they can start this path of righteousness. So, if you would, just bow your heads with me. And repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I come to you in prayer asking for the forgiveness of my sins. I confess with my mouth and believe with my heart that Jesus is your Son and that he died on the cross that I might be forgiven and have eternal life. Father, I believe that Jesus rose from the dead and I ask you right now to come into my life and be my personal Lord and Savior. I repent of my sins and I will worship you all the days of my life. I confess with my mouth that I am born again and cleansed by the blood of Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. So throughout these next couple weeks, I want you to just try to see people in a different way. Just love them for who they are. 
no matter what they are. Amen? Amen. Praise God that God is our righteousness. You don't have to defend yourself because he's our righteousness. Um, we're going to get ready to close. But I want more than anything, I want you to know that God loves you. That he loves you. That he loves you so much. And I'm not going to start talking again or anything like that. We're going to close in prayer. But I just want you to cherish that. That he loves you. If you could just stand. and Over this next week, I want you to make a covenant with yourself that you're going to receive the love of God and that you're going to give it to others. And if you can, sometimes just pick up the phone. And even if you can't call, just text somebody. I'm learning now the value of texting. So even if you can't call, just text. And so I want us to make a covenant to reaching out to each other more. Amen. And so let's just pray um, and be praying over the neighborhood as we continue to reach out to them. Not for the sake of growing the church, but for growing the kingdom. Amen. Father, I bless you for your people. I thank you, God, that you are our righteousness. God, there's so many things that we're finding out about you, God. Every single day. And so, God, we bless you, God. We thank you for being our God. We thank you, God, that we're more than enough. We thank you, God, that you loved us, that you chose us. Thank you, God, that you've already spoken your love over us. And so, God, all I have to do is just repeat that you, what you say, that you know the thoughts and the plans that you have for us. And so, God, I speak life over your people, that they'll be blessed in the city, that they'll be blessed in the field, that they'll be blessed whenever they come and whenever they go. God, I still speak that the enemies may come at them one way but flee in seven. Or, God, that you would touch their heart and they would repent, which means change their mind and change their direction. And that we would worship you together. So, God, I thank you, God, that you do all things well. God, I pray over all of our children, God, even the ones who aren't here. I pray over our loved ones, God, that we're believing to be saved. And so, God, I thank you, God, that although we may leave this place, we'll never leave your presence. And so, God, I bless you. I speak life over even some of the members who aren't here right now, God, and I just say, have your way. God, we bless you. We praise you and we honor you, God. We bind depression. And we thank you, God, that you are our righteousness. And so, God, we thank you, God, that we'll be fruitful in all things according to your word. We bless you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Listen, I want you to go in peace and enjoy the favor of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Oh, oh, hey, guys, listen. Impromptu. At the back of the church, there are some, uh, some Valentines for you. Just take one on their way out. Amen. Amen. I am my beloved and my beloved is mine. Amen.